It's the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Tune in. Tune in. Tune in. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Before we get into this episode, please take a moment to subscribe. Leave us a five-star rating and review wherever you're listening to this podcast at. It'll help us go up in the rankings. It'll help us to reach more people. So thank you in advance for supporting us in that way. Very excited for this interview today. Uh, Here with me, I have Don Peebles, CEO of the Peebles Corporation, and Victor McFarland, CEO of McFarland Partners. Thank you both so much for taking some time. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Happy to be here. Definitely, definitely. So let's jump right into it. Uh, so both of you have collaborated on Angels Landing here in downtown L.A. It'll be a one point six billion dollar development. And this is going to be the largest uh, project built by a black team. So huge deal. And I would definitely love to start the interview with that. Uh, can you both tell us more about it? Can you both also tell us about uh, why you decided to collaborate on this venture? Well, I'll take the second part question real quick, easy. I didn't want to compete against Victor. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. <laughs> so that made it so we could work, to, we, we, we joined forces for that reason. And, and of course, the fact is that we, we work together, we're friends, and uh, um, we uh, compliment, um, and, and Victor's and his firm have been a part of transforming uh, downtown LA um, for quite some time, um, you know, with many projects, including LA Live and uh, Park Fifth, which they did um, recently, which is a, a couple blocks away from Angels Landing. Uh, so made us a very compelling uh, team as well. Yeah, I would add, it was intentional. I mean, like Don mentioned, we're friends. Uh, we're two of the largest, if not the two largest African-American developers in the country. Uh, and to collaborate on this was important to us. Uh, not just because of what we could create together, but because of the message that it sends. Love it, love it. And uh, what's your vision for this project? Go ahead, Victor. You want to take it, or you want me? To... Go ahead. Um, I mean, we, we wanted. I mean, we wanted to build a transformative project, and both of our firms um, are um, focused on how we build our buildings, which is extremely important to us both. Which is economic inclusion and economic empowerment uh, for African-American professionals and entrepreneurs. And so we wanted to do something different um, and we wanted to be consistent with what our focus has been in terms of inclusion. And uh, and so we proposed building, um, you know, two um, major buildings that are one's 900 feet tall and round numbers, one's 500 feet tall. Um, It's a million and a half uh, square feet uh, of space two hotels, um, a five-star hotel and the, the tall tower, or the taller because they're both super tall buildings, and the 500-foot tower would be um, a lifestyle luxury hotel, and and then apartments above both, retail, um, and uh, you know outdoor plaza area and, and the like. Um, the project um, budget is about $1.6 billion, um, and, uh, and Victor and I you know, want to make sure that it becomes, you know, it is an economic engine um, for, you know, a downtown LA and one that sets the tone for um, a much greater economic inclusion when it comes to women and African American and minority businesses as a whole. Yeah, I would add, it's a signature project for downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and quite honestly, at this stage of our career, those are the kind of things that Don and I want to focus on. To, to do for all the traditional real estate reasons uh, in terms of being good real estate and great locations and things that make money. But also it's time that African-American developers are seen as being capable of doing these mega projects that others have done. You know, or $1.6 billion, as you mentioned earlier, will be the largest one done by African-Americans, at least until Don does Affirmation Tower in New York, which will be twice that size. So, <laughs> you know, the trend line is good. <laughs> Definitely, definitely love it. Um, and, you know, I was doing a lot of research and this project is going to have a huge economic impact in L.A. So can you share a bit more about that and just what it's going to do for the city economically? Yeah, um, well, any project of this size, you know, uh, the, you know, two, two ways in which we're impacting. One Don touched upon is to make sure that, you know, that a, a third of the economic benefits, you know, are going to 
women and minority owned firms. You know, that's over half a billion dollars of, of economic benefit rolling back into the overall community of people who don't normally get that kind of benefit. Additionally, what we have worked for is working with the unions and the hotel unions is to make sure that afterwards that the operators of these properties also have representative minorities and women on their staff so that the people who operate these properties also have look and feel like the overall community. That also is a long-term economic benefit. The city for itself, obviously, when a project is this scale, the hotel tax revenues, the property tax revenues, uh, the things that support the Olympics, um, all of those will have a long-term multi-billion dollar impact to the benefit of Los Angeles as a corporate entity. Love it. And one thing that was mentioned was that about a third of the contracting will be going towards women and minority owned businesses. And I want people to really understand that and how significant that is. Uh, why was that a priority for you in this project? Well, by the way, it's a, it's a, it, a third is, um, you know, the goal, the minimum goal. So we hope to, to do better. Mm -hmm. But it was important because we think that the economic opportunities generated by developments ought to be um, provided to people reflective of the population demographics. And you've got LA being an extremely diverse community, and yet the economic um, benefits and economic opportunities are relatively concentrated. Um, and, and, and so we think that that is, I mean, something that needs to change. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, we feel that, you know, we should set a tone and hopefully that sets the tone for other developers who develop in Los Angeles and other parts of the country um, that, you know, economic inclusion um, is something that's key. You know, uh, we're going to, I mean, you know, just to give you a sense of the magnitude of the project, mm -hmm. the workers who work on Angels Landing and design and construction will, will earn a, a collective amount of about $731 million. Um, 500 new jobs will be created by vendors serving Angels Landing Hotel and Restaurant and Retail alone. Um, and, uh, and, and so, I mean, you look at those kinds of economic impacts, there's more than 8,300 jobs that will be created during construction. And we think that those jobs ought to be, you know, held by people reflective of the population demographics. Definitely. And, and one thing I love about that is, you know, we see in communities everywhere, there's developments, there's new buildings, but very seldomly do people get an opportunity to understand what's happening behind the scenes, like understand all the jobs that are being created, what it's going to do for the economy. You know, a lot of it is much more than just a tall building or buildings being put up. There's a whole lot of people who can benefit positively from it. So I think it's great that this project will, will make a statement in that way. Yeah, I mean, it's very important. Yeah, and what you'll usually find, and one of the things we're trying to change, which Don touched on earlier, is most of the time these mega projects are being done by white developers who basically say we can't find. So that they're normally pushing down the amount of commitment that they're making to women and minorities to the ten or fifteen percent range, mm -hmm. and then substituting it primarily with white women. You know what we have said is that it should be women and minorities having a significant role in these projects, and we're the ones increasing the amount of we committed to a number that's far in excess of what the city was going to make us commit to, you know? So we're demonstrating not just for ourselves, but to all developers and major projects that this can be done and done in a class, class A project uh, without a detriment to quality or to economics. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so one thing I would love to hear from both of you, what does affirmative development mean to you? Well, I think that what, I mean, as, as a as a company, that's kind of our tagline, mm -hmm. which is, and what it means is that our country has uh, systemically discriminated um, and oppressed African Americans from the time of slavery till you know 249 years of slavery, 100 plus years of segregation, and then you go on and look at the 100 years of you know challenging opportunity, challenge, impact, you know, limitations of opportunity. So in order to right those wrongs and to level the playing field, there needs to be affirmative steps taken. So there was affirmative action in education, affirmative action in contracting. In the 1980s and 1990s, 
those efforts were being attacked. Um, we don't believe that we see the real estate development business as one that is lacks diversity, that does not offer clear pathways to opportunity in terms of career advancement and economic opportunities for African Americans um, or other minorities. Um, and so we don't think you can change that by just keeping the status quo, that we've got to take aggressive, bold steps to change it, like committing uh, to the level of inclusion that we've done um, in Angels Landing of 30%, um, you know, minority and women-owned business contracting. And so that's an affirmative way of developing. So we're going to take the principles of, we're gonna reach out, we're gonna expand, you know, our reach, we're going to widen our lens to look for talent, and we're going to go out and attract the best and the brightest, but they will be reflective of our population and they will be diverse. Love it. Love it. So both of you have been in the business for over 40 years. So take us back to the beginning. You know, what inspired you to get into real estate and also what inspired you to uh, go out on your own and start your own businesses? <laughs> and, uh, um, I grew up sleeping on the couch with my sister until I was 12 years old, uh, watching my cousins have better toys than, than I had. Uh, one thing I learned early on that people who said the best things in life are free, I already had a secure economic base. Mm -hmm. um, so the one thing I wanted to do was major was not to be poor. When I uh, was looking back in those days at Fortune 500 in terms of who the primary people who had money were back in those days, this was before tech, obviously, uh, were real estate families, you know. So that was my first idea. And I didn't really know what real estate was growing up. I thought it was like people who sold houses next door. Um, but, you know, after law school and business school, you know, I joined Etten in the real estate investment department. And, and that was the foundation of my career. Definitely. And uh, Victor, after work, I guess after getting some work experience, you know, what was the turning point for you where you decided you wanted to start your own business? Yeah, I always knew I was on the path of being an entrepreneur, you know, so uh, I moved quickly at Aetna um, and then I joined uh, at four years. I had an opportunity to join a back in those days, a private place and syndicator and I opened up. I moved from Hartford to Denver to open up their office. And um, while I was technically employed, I was strictly commission based. So mm -hmm. you kind of eat what you kill. Uh, and while I was doing that, uh, I started my first apartment complex on the north side of Denver and built a 208 unit apartment complex in Denver. And, and that started me on the McFarland Partners path uh, of uh, first the development and then starting an institutional investment management business and continue to expand our development business today. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. What about uh, you, Don? How did you get into the business and uh, what inspired you to start out on your own? My mother start. My mother start. My mother exposed me to real estate. She um, had me at nineteen, um, and after being divorced, um, we moved to Detroit, Michigan. Um, I was eight years old, and we moved to Detroit because um, her sister was living in Detroit with her husband. And my mother had worked as a secretary and administrative assistant in D.C. And after buying a home. Um, with her second husband um, in Prince George's County, she saw the line item for commission and saw how much was made with little effort and said, thought she could do that. And she got her license um, and then started in Detroit. So I remember taking my uncle and I driving her to an interview at a real estate brokerage company. Mm -hmm. And it was just, I think it was on seven mile or six mile. And there was a row of just real estate company after real estate company. They were all kind of consolidated. And so I was aware of it and she explained it to me and that's how I got exposed to it. And, uh, and that was the beginning of my exposure. And I knew that in real estate for, for, for the last 10 years of me being in our household was a source of income mm -hmm. uh, to support um, our household. And, uh, and then I you know, got exposed to it in that way. And, and that was kind of the beginning. And then I was going to go to, I went to school. I was going to be a doctor like my uncle in mm -hmm. Detroit. Um, and after my first year, I um, changed my mind. I went back to DC and started working in real estate as a sales agent, but interest rates were 
about 16, 18 percent. Wow. It was 1979. And uh, so I started um, appraising. And my mother had uh, had been at Fannie Mae and left to start her own consulting firm. And so I did residential appraising under her and another person. And then, you know, from there, I got more politically engaged and um, and also and then started my own appraisal business in 83 when I was 23. And then from there, I started working on my first development deal. I got a great opportunity from the then mayor of Washington, Marion Barry. And in 1986, started as a developer building a building in uh, Southeast Washington, DC in a community called Anacostia. And that was designed to kickstart economic redevelopment uh, for uh, that area. And uh, so that was my first project. And that's how I got started in the development business. And from there, um, you know, I it grew and expanded in other places, but I got my start mm -hmm. and it's important. I, I mean, I want to amplify it because mm -hmm. it's important that I got my start with a, a black mayor who was willing to take a chance and give me an opportunity. And, uh, and I valued that opportunity and, and worked you know very hard to live up to it, but I was getting, he, he put trust in me and gave me an opportunity as a 26 year old. In fact, when I first was working on that deal, I was 25. Wow. And he gave me the opportunity and the, had the confidence that I would be able to execute and, uh, you know, st stuck it out with me and gave me my chance. And that's what I, how I got started. And if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And you, you both have had a tremendous amount of success throughout your careers. Can you talk to us about uh, some challenges you've experienced, you've experienced that have helped you um, continue to succeed in the end? Well, I'll go first. I'll, I'll give you mine. So follow that story about Barry giving me my first start. Mm -hmm. When that deal, when I was negotiating the deal with the city, um, one day I came back from a meeting into my office, my appraisal business, mm -hmm. and my assistant gave me, back then the messages were on little sheets of paper. They were like, you, and she handed me my messages. I went through and one of them was from a reporter of the Washington Post. And I said, oh, wow, people are, and he wants to talk to me about 2100 Martin Luther King Avenue. So good news travels fast. They're gonna do a positive story. Young African-American uh, born and raised in DC uh, is building this building in a historically black neighborhood and you know, all good, right? So I called and it turned out he was an investigative reporter from the Washington Post and wanted to do a story about how Barry was helping a political insider. Now me at 25 years old, I did not consider myself a political insider. <laughs> and so I could not believe it. And I said, I'd call him back. And uh, so I uh, ended up calling the mayor's press secretary and she talked me through how to do an interview. I'd never done one before. Mm -hmm. um, and she walked me through how to do it and what to do. And I met with the reporter and he, they did the story. And um, I, one of the things I had known, I wanted to, I wanted to deal so badly. I undercut the price. The city had was willing to do a, the same deal with a white developer, but he didn't have site control mm -hmm. and I got site control and they were going to lease it for $22 and 50 cents a square foot. I proposed 1875 a foot. Um, and so I was better financially. And, and so that helped me. But one morning I woke, I, you know, woke up, got the newspaper and right next to Ronald Reagan in the Iran Contra affair was my little building in Anacostia. And so I was, I mean, in DC, everybody wanted to be very quiet. And uh, so I was like, oh my God. And, they were, and the headline was that the mayor was paying me above market rent to a political insider. The body of the story was overall not bad, mm -hmm. but I was disappointed and I met a friend of mine uh, for lunch and we were meeting at this power lunch place called Joe and Moe's in DC. So I walk in and as I get down the stairs into the restaurant, you walk down the stairs into the restaurant, there was a, at the bar was um, a guy named Billy Fitzgerald and he was the uh, chairperson of Independence Federal Savings Bank, which was the largest um, black owned bank um, in uh, the United States. And he stood up, came over to me and shook my hand and said, welcome to the club. <laughs> and what he told me was there were not going to be any fans mm -hmm. except us. We're going to root for each other. Mm -hmm. And 
all of us. And, he, and there were a couple other black business people at the bar. He introduced me to them. And, and he told me, the Washington Post and none of the media, they're not going to be your fans. No one's going to root for you. And they're going to all be quiet when there's a bump in the road. So expect it. Don't expect a fan club. And when I needed support, that we had to be there for each other. And, um, uh, it, you know, it made me feel a lot better. Yep. Um, and I went on and got my deal done. But that was a very, I mean, I, it was every, the deal meant, de- you know, everything. I mean, it was me getting started. And here it was the most powerful newspaper who had brought down the, the president, um, Richard Nixon. And they were targeting me um, and my little one deal in Anacostia. And uh, so Barry, in spite of it, um, didn't back down. In fact, he accelerated it and had the lease signed by the city administrator within days and uh, told me, don't worry. And I saw him that evening and he told me it's a one day story. Forget it. Yeah. And uh, and that was it. So that was my moment. And I think I realized that um, it was not I couldn't believe it. I thought mm-hmm. I was so idealistic and I thought that. They, the media would be happy to see um, a black developer build in a black community mm-hmm. um, and do something transformative. And I was shocked um, when it came off a different way. Definitely, definitely. Well, as they say, the rest was history after that. Yeah, I mean, it was. I mean, it certainly. I mean, and, and, it, and the media was used against me again. Yep. And so I made a decision ultimately to get better at dealing with the media. Right, because every time right. I was going to try to do something, they were they were going to be used, especially the Washington Post at that time, mm-hmm. um, owned by a very staunch conservative family that wanted to keep the status quo the way it was in D.C. And mm-hmm. that was a majority black city being economically ruled by white business people. Right. And uh, so I just realized that I had to get better at it. And then ultimately, you know, I needed to do business in places that were more hospitable. Right. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, how about for you, Victor? Uh, what are some challenges that you experienced um, during your career um, that were difficult in the moment, but ultimately uh, helped you to be able to persist and, and succeed? Yeah. Well, I mean, you don't have a career as long as mine and you don't. And there are multiple examples. Yeah. Um, but I'll start out. I mean, you know, the, you know, after I told you about that project in Denver, the market cycle in Denver was way down. Mm-hmm. And the company I've been working for was a private place, the syndicator, and went out of business after the 1985 tax law. So I was looking around to decide what to do, whether to go develop elsewhere or to do something else. And at the time, my brother-in-law, Frank Borges, was a state treasurer of Connecticut. Mm-hmm. He said, you know, you really ought to start an institutional investment advisory business. You got that background and there are no African-Americans in the field, it'll be a slam dunk. Well, it wasn't a slam dunk. And one of the things I learned, which is carried over, which Don, I'm sure, could talk about as well, is the institutional roadblocks that get set up that prevent you from succeeding or trying to prevent you from succeeding. You know, when I started my investment management business uh, back in 1987, the oldest uh, real, private real estate investment management firm, maybe Reef or somebody like that, was, I think, four or five years old. Mm-hmm. Um, but... There were all these instances. So I started marketing, going out and talking to pension funds and staff. And, you know, and I was calling on people, you know, 25 people a week, you know, talking to them, trying to explain myself, present my background. Uh, I remember one particular uh, pension fund, I won't say their name, you know, after I visited, I had a nice meeting with them. And, um, and <clears throat> you know, after the meeting, you know, I had I knew the one guy, so we had breakfast together, and and I said, you know, he said, well, Victor, you don't meet the minimum qualifications. I said, well, what are the minimum qualifications? At that time, he said, it was, you have to have five hundred million dollars of man of of real estate under management, mm-hmm. which is today would be nothing, but back then was a relatively big number, you know, and and all that was was the amount that was the largest amount that the the private the white firm they have been doing business with for a few years, that was their size, you know? And I said, well, who sets policy? And he said, the board sets policy. I said, well, I think I'm going to talk to the board then. He got all upset. The staff guy who ran half of that real estate group threw his napkin down on the table, didn't finish his breakfast, walked out basically saying on the way out, what makes you think you have the right to manage money for us? Wow. You know, so 
I actually, so I took that story to the board members and I said, this staff guy told me I shouldn't talk to you, that I don't have the right to invest. You know, here's my background. Um, you know, and, and there were a couple of members uh, who said, well, that's interesting. He doesn't have the right to tell us what to do. Around the same time, Maxine Waters and Willie Brown were having hearings in California to talk about the lack of institutional investors, black institutional investment managers for CalPERS, you know, and CalSTRS, the two largest funds in there, you know. And I remember she had the CIO, Dewitt Bowman, who I had met a number of times over a couple of years, you know, on the stand. She said, well, why don't you have more people? And I remember she's, I was sitting in the front row and she said, do you know Victor McFarland? He said, yes, I know him. She said, do you think he's qualified to manage money for coppers? And he said, yes. Are you looking for a community of like-minded individuals and access to experts in real estate? Yeah. Are you interested in real estate but need more support and guidance? You know who it is. The Black Real Estate Dialogue presents the Real Estate Investing Community. How much or how little real estate experience you have, we've created a community for you because your perspective is important. All right, tell me, where's the number one place where you can do Q&A with experienced guest speakers two times per month? How about unlimited access to past guest speakers recordings? What, what, what about a private Slack channel to engage in daily discussion with everybody in the community to share resources and support each other? Head on over to BlackRealEstateDialogue.com. That's BlackRealEstateDialogue.com. It's the real estate investing community presented by the Black Real Estate Dialogue. Come join us today. Join us today. Join us today. Uh, now that didn't lead to immediate money. It still took two years, but mm -hmm. that was a break. But those obstacles still exist today. There today it's maybe worse because there are more gatekeepers today than there were back when I was starting. You know, back because there were none. You know, they hadn't put in the place where you had to have these consultants, at least in real estate consultants you had to go through, or these emerging manager programs, which usually limit people from growth. Um, but you know. Those are the kind of things that you have to continue. I mean, it happens also on the development side as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for Angels Landing, you know, we've been in this five, six years already. You know, it takes stamina and the ability to go up against the institutional organization and structure to succeed. Definitely. Definitely. And Victor, uh, one of the things your company focuses on is investments that promote smart growth. So for those who may not know what smart growth is, can you explain uh, what that is and, and why it's important to uh, your company? Yeah, you know, the, actually our company actually got started. I mean, the fund, the urban fund that we got started was focused on, was first focused on the fact, which is part of smart growth, that institutional investment, institutional investment funds, pension funds mm -hmm. did not invest in the inner city uh, prior to our initial fund that I did with Magic Johnson back in the mid nineties, but before then it was considered to be social investing. Uh, and so after the LA riots or uprising, depending on your perspective, CalPERS asked all of his then existing investment managers, could anyone come up with an institutionally based approach for investing in the inner city? You know, they got one response that was us and uh, with Irvin and that started the first institutional investment fund for investing in the inner city and in urban communities. And smart growth is basically about taking advantage of the fact that urban centers already have infrastructure, you know, that they, you can take advantage of piping, all that kind of stuff. Whereas if you keep laying down uh, suburbs, you need more materials, you need more, more of everything, roads, pipes, everything, which are not efficient and increase greenhouse gas, the, all that kind of stuff. So it's really taking advantage of the existing infrastructure to improve your outcomes. Definitely, definitely. And um, can you talk a bit more about that venture um, with Magic Johnson and just some of the things you were able to accomplish with that fund? Well, the main thing about that fund ended up being was a proof of concept, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, because no one had ever done it before. So, you know, one of our first investments, Ladera Shopping Center, which would have been overrun by gangs, but was in a nice little at La Tierra and Ladera uh, corner where we put in one of the first Magic Johnson Starbucks. Back then, people didn't think black people would pay three bucks for coffee. They did something <laughs> wrong. Um, you know, we the grocery store was going to leave. We convinced them to stay. We doubled the size of the grocery store. We made it safe 
which is a primary ingredient for most of these urban communities, mm -hmm. is to make things safe. Um, and from there, you know, billions of dollars. I mean, urban, I ended up selling my company at the time, the GE Capital, and ended up buying out urban. And he went on and formed Canyon Johnson. So we ended up with two successful firms investing in urban communities. But um, that proof of concept made a big difference for it opened up the door, but I still have to say, most institutional investment managers will do urban investments, but they still won't do much in the inner city part of the urban. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely appreciate that. And uh, Don, your company has developed a great expertise in public-private partnerships, which I, which I think is fascinating. Can you explain more of what that is, like public-private partnerships? It might be a new concept to some of the listeners and just how it's helped your company grow? Well, I think the first thing is that the public-private uh, projects involve the government in one form or another. So our first building uh, that I described, 2100 Martin Luther King Avenue, that was a public-private partnership because the city pre-leased office space in the building. What we do as a company pretty much, including Angels Landing, is that we acquire the development rights to sites that are owned by the public sector. Mm -hmm. We feel that we get, in theory, a more level playing field doing business with the government than the private sector. Um, we get the opportunity to pursue sites in urban um, high density areas that are supply constrained and access to available sites is more limited. And the public private space allows us to go in and get into those markets um, and uh, allows us to develop a, a, a buildings on government land in markets where there's very little available development land left. And so, and we feel, and also price is one determining factor. Generally speaking, um, in the private sector, price is the sole determining factor. If I'm gonna buy a piece of land from a, um, a property owner who's in the private sector, they are looking to maximize their profit. In the public sector, the government's not a land speculator. So they're looking for jobs, economic opportunities, economic development specific uses that can support, you know, the, the, the plans for that community um, and, uh, and many other issues, design. And so uh, that allows us to compete very favorably um, by being creative. And so that is why we have focused in that space and, um, you know, because of those elements and that makes them unique. Um, but if you look at the more transformative developments in many major cities around the country, they generally are public-private developments. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Um, and Don, another project that you're working on is Affirmation Tower um, in New York City, my, my hometown from Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. it, when it's built, it'll be the largest building in the Western Hemisphere. So it sounds like you're definitely competing with Angels Landing. Uh, but can you tell us a bit more about that project as well? Yeah, well, Angels Landing is much more... Um, ahead of the you know process, Angels Landing's mm -hmm. entitled. Um, we're in the pre-development phase of that project now. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, Angels Landing is you know in terms of the, it, it, the execution is more is is more prevalent now, more present now. Affirmation Tower is a proposal that we propose to build on what's called Site K um, on 11th Avenue across the street from the Jacob Javits Convention Center, which is one of the more productive and largest convention centers um, in the country. Uh, and what we are proposing is to build the first um, uh, Black-owned skyscraper in New York City and likely the second Black-owned skyscraper in the country after Angel's Landing. And Affirmation Tower would be um, 1,663 feet tall. It would become the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, include two hotels, an office space, a roof deck, an observation deck, a um, ice skating ring on the roof. Um, but the goal of being designed by David Ajay, who is the most, one of the most prominent architects in the world, um, happens to be um, Black. He did the Museum for African American History and Culture in the Smithsonian in D.C. Uh, and, uh, and there, um, we're going to have it built by, in part, by a a uh, black um, owned construction company uh, led by a black woman, oldest, it's the oldest construction company, black construction company in the country with Kizak. And so to do a transformative project that affirms access to economic opportunity. And that's why we came up with the name Affirmation Tower, because it's affirming 
um, the econo um, economic inclusion and economic empowerment in um, a manner of how we do business with affirmative development. So all a part of giving us our rightful um, place in terms of economic inclusion. And New York City is America's most diverse city. And yet not one skyscraper has been built by black developers, um, not um, one major skyscraper built by a black contractor. Uh, and so we, you know, hope that, uh, um, you know, Affirmation Tower will change that and set a different tone. Definitely, definitely. Have there been any challenges in getting that project uh, moving forward? Many. And right now we're working on getting the governor to make a decision to award it to us because mm -hmm. um, it's a public private site. Um, it's got unprecedented support within the community, by the way, regardless of race, but then heavily um, supported in the black community over 95%. Um, and uh, overall throughout the state has an 84% approval rating for Democratic voters, high 70s with Republicans because we polled it. And, uh, and, and so, um, and high 70s with all voters, including Republicans. Um, and so um, we, uh, the big obstacle there is frankly, um, getting um, the state to make a decision to award it. We're gonna have the NAACP's headquarters there. Mm -hmm. And we're working right now with Reverend Sharpton and his team to, um, to uh, come up with an agreement to house the, uh, the Civil Rights Museum uh, and uh, you know, which would be appropriate to have it in that building because that's a big part of what civil rights um, the fight was for. Um, you know, uh, when Dr. King was assassinated, um, he was focused on economic empowerment um, and made his comment that what good does it do to, um, to the, uh, for a Negro to uh, de be at a sit at the lunch counter uh, when he can't afford to buy a hamburger. So it's all about economic inclusion. So. Um, but anyway, that's, I mean, that's the obstacle we're fighting for it and we feel, you know, um, you know, we're going to keep pushing. Nothing's easy and I don't expect it to be easy. Back to my first story. Yeah. Um, you know, so we're going to keep pushing. And, uh, and that was, I mean, that's one of the major reasons that Victor and I have, uh, worked together and committed the kind of money that we have spent so far on Angels Landing was that we want to change the landscape figuratively, you know, visually and economically. Definitely, definitely. And uh, from both of your perspectives, uh, how can we create more opportunity for black developers to uh, to rise, to make impact, and um, have some of the same success that you, you two have had over the last 40 years or so? Access to capital. I think that's the first thing Victor told the story. Imagine, um, while it's a while ago, and Victor's been in, in the in the asset management business, you know, a, a long time, considering you know firms come and go. But um, the fact that to this day, there's no firm in the private equity space in the real estate space like the firm Victor built, mm -hmm. not one. And that's the, a travesty here. And so the challenge that we have, um, real estate's a capital intensive business, and Capital is provided by institutions um, through private equity funds for equity, and yet black entrepreneurs don't get access to it. To give you a sense, there is $69 trillion currently invested in venture capital and private equity. $69 trillion. Now, President Biden has spent $2 trillion trying to save uh, the country from COVID, and yet $69 trillion is invested in venture capital and private equity. Out of that $69 trillion, less than 1.3% of it is invested in firms founded, owned, or run by women and people of color combined. Wow. That means that 98.7% of the $69 trillion that goes into venture capital and private equity firms goes to white men. Now, how can that possibly be fair? And one of the reasons that happens is because 98% of the capital allocators who run these funds are run by white men too. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the bigger travesty is that the big investors in those funds are the public pension systems like LA County, um, LA City, CalSTRS and CalPERS as Victor pointed out, they and New York State Common, New York City, and all of these um, are, these are funds that are managing money for 
working people who work for the government or teachers. Mm -hmm. They represent the population demographics and are very diverse. So we can't even get access to our own money. And that's uh, so I think anyone who wants to get into the development business, I think one of the things that we all will share in common is an insufficient access to capital. And so that has to change. And we all have to be more mindful of that because otherwise it's very hard to get into the development business if you don't have access to capital. But just visualize that 14 percent of that sixty nine trillion dollars um, went to black developers more reflective of our population demographics. I mean, so what you're talking about there is about $10 trillion. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so that's what needs to happen. Act fair access to capital. Definitely. What's your perspective, Victor? Yeah, <clears throat> and definitely capital. I mean, as John has pointed out, that's where you see most African-American developers focus on affordable housing where the capital uh, needs are a little bit less than they can get, but it also means that there's less wealth, less wealth building because there's constrained uh, profit margins and all of those types of deals. You know, the, the, the blockage is also, you know, these institutions, they hide behind, as I was talking about these minimum qualification rules that they set up, you know, you know, it's like when I first started, I mean, you know, well, how do I get 500 million under asset management if, if no one will, if everybody has the same MQs, you know, if nobody's willing to take a risk, you know, back then what I used to do is I used to compare my background, you know, in resume against the firms that who started Wreath. And I said, here's what the guys look like when they started. Here's what I look like. You know, if we're both starting from the same block, who has a better resume, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but I mean, we still ran into the same issues. And that's what you run into now is, you know, it is hard for these developers. I mean, I created an emerging developer program with Cal Sturz to try to address some of this, which basically meant that developers need the opportunity to also get through, you know, one of the things is, I mean, it shouldn't just be a one time. I mean, for example, if we're in the midst of a, the great recession mm -hmm. and a property doesn't do well, well, there's no properties doing well. Why is it that white developers and white investment managers get another shot, but it's the same black developer who has similar results does get another shot? Because therefore, it must be because of them as opposed to the economy. I mean, we need to get over and have some colorblind, our colorblind execution of some of these rules, mm -hmm. because I don't think that we're having colorblind execution of the rules. Definitely. Uh, so for those who are in the development space or want to be in the development space as difficult as it is like how can they break through and get that capital do you think the system needs to be overhauled do you think there's something else that needs to be done well i mean i can add to that i think that um it's the 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 standard and victor touched on it in one area there's another area too about competency and qualifications. So in a public competitive process or other processes, developers are evaluated based on their ability to execute and their track record, if you will. And so the deeper and you know more extensive and larger track record prevails. So imagine if you've had it all to yourself for 400 years. Mm -hmm. And so how in the world can anyone who has, who's been on the outside of that 400 years um, come in and compete? And so if that's a standard, you'll never have a fair chance for black developers um, because the stand, no, the other groups will always have a deeper track record and they get more opportunities and more capital. So their balance sheet will be bigger and the number of the dollar amount of your deals are, are bigger. It's like, take imagine um, the uh, Indianapolis 500 that was just run this spring. Mm -hmm. And you got the Indianapolis 500 and you got um, two drivers. You got driver A and driver A is in a Ferrari and uh, you know, and he's, and, and he's a great driver. And, um, and then you got driver B who's also in a Ferrari and driver B is a better driver. 
slightly better driver. But driver A gets to start off on lap 450. And driver B starts off on lap one. And then they say, gentlemen, start your engines. Both of you all have the same car. You guys are in a meritocracy now. And may the best driver win. Now, of course, the only way that driver B wins is if driver A crashes and burns because it's impossible for a driver B to catch someone who has a 450 lap start. Well, white developers have had a 450 year head start. And so the criteria for selection and providing opportunities or the standard of how you deploy capital and when who gets access to capital cannot be that way because it's systemically discriminatory. And the idea the reality is if you built one or two buildings, then you know you should be able to go ahead and do another one just as well. And you don't have to have done 10 or 20 or be the third generation, mm -hmm. you know, and the one that, you know, didn't flunk out of school because, you know, you're going to stagger along and work in the family business that's been around for a hundred years or 200 years. I mean, it's just not fair. And until that changes, um, we won't have the kind of breakthroughs that we need because the institutions are, I mean, it's just like we're out trying to raise an emerging developer fund mm -hmm. and, and right after George Floyd murder and everybody's saying, Hey, we want to do more for, you know, black entrepreneurs, et cetera. I, we probably presented to 25 different investors and mainly public employee pension systems. Most of them say, Hey, we don't do first time funds. And just think about what I just said. Right. They don't right. do first time funds. And what Victor said, there are not any other black funds out here. So no first time funds. What that means is there's no more black funds out there. And that's why there aren't any more. And doesn't matter that I've been building buildings for 37 years successfully. And doesn't matter that their money has been in my deals through their asset managers. Um, it's that it's a first time fund and they don't invest in first time funds. And the irony is, is that the consultants who are advising them, many of them have their own funds too, but they're all part of that incestuous institutional um, obstacles that stop that. Because they all know that if they open the floodgates and there's more of us in, then we're gonna have more success and there's not going to be any argument. But if you don't have a first, if, saying there's no first time fund means, hey, we're not letting anybody get out of the gate now. Yeah, definitely. Definitely appreciate you uh, sharing. Uh, Victor, anything you want to add to that? No, I mean, I can only tag along on that. I mean, you know, the, the bottom line is true. I mean, the when you think about the Don and I, like I said, the amongst the largest, if not the largest, we face similar things, I mean, against, people who are backed by, you know, $100 billion of capital. It doesn't matter that, yes, we've demonstrated we can do a couple billion dollars. I mean, it's, it is very hard to win these battles. And so we had to work very hard and to demonstrate our capacity and our capabilities and to shoot down any objections that people have around that. So you can imagine what it is for someone smaller. Definitely, definitely. So with all that being said, um, what would your advice be to an aspiring black developer who's just trying to get started, um, what, what would you tell them to do? Well, one of the things I've learned, first thing is, I mean, you definitely should have enough capital to stay the course for a little lo longer than a few months mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, it's going to take some time to those who can figure out a way uh, to, to get startup capital or to an initial investment capital, you know, in a deal then they should do that. If they have to start smaller uh, to get some track record, then they should do that as well. Awesome. What about you, Don? I, I agree with Victor. Um, I think, though, that you've got to expect it um, uh, to, to not be easy. Um, and you got to get started. So you got to get going. And sometimes that's going to mean that you're going to have to you know, do it, you know, with, you know, um, you know, the, not the best of circumstances and not all the resources. You're going to have to mafia adjust and you're going to have to, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, 
use a little glue here, a little glue there, a little spit here, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, you know, make ends meet to get it done. Uh, because, I mean, it's not going to be fair. Mm -hmm. and, and making a lot of money in general for anybody is not easy. But what most people can operate from a perspective that they're operating in a, an arena that's fair to them. So with black developers, I think people have to understand that um, it may not be fair. And also don't let people um, uh, lower your expectations or your, or your goals or your dreams. Um, pursue them. Love it. Love it. And last question. YouTube had a lot of success um, over many decades and you're still going. Uh, so what's one thing that keeps you going? Um, I'm working. I, mean, I, I like to think, you know, Angels Landing is a good example. Affirmation Tower is another good example. I'm not working um, for money. I mean, I, I, we need money to stay in business, but I'm working for a purpose. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to, to be an agent of change um, about our industry. And that's, you know, while Victor and I are working together in part because we both share that desire and that goal and while we're building Angels Landing because and how we're building it. Um, so we b believe, I think we both believe that business can be a tool of transformation. And so I'm motivated um, to make an impact in that area uh, to um, make it easier for the next generation and be a provider of, of, of opportunities as well, like some that were provided to me. Love it, love it. Uh, what about you, Victor? What, what keeps you going? You know, um, I mean, exciting projects uh, like doing things with Don. Yeah. And also, I mean, just figuring out a way to help leave a little bit of a legacy so that, you know, my firm won't be, have been the largest forever. Uh, yeah. that someone else will pass me up while I'm still alive to see it. Um, you know, and then as with Don, to continue doing projects with him and show that, you know, people can do, African Americans can do things to scale together uh, without it turning into an adversarial position. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you two spending some time today interviewing on the show talking about the projects you have going on, talking about your history. You know, I really think it's a motivation and an inspiration to all of us, really, um, that you can start anywhere and achieve success. And I really also appreciate that you two are committed uh, to creating more opportunities for us and people who look like us. So definitely uh, appreciate you two taking some time to be on the show tonight, today. Thank you, Sam, and congratulations on your success. Thank you, I appreciate that, Victor. Sam, thank you for providing the platform for us to talk to your audience about things that are important to all of us. Definitely, definitely, truly appreciate it. And uh, thank you all again for listening to another episode of the Black Real Estate Dialogue podcast. Please don't forget to leave us a five-star rating and review. Also, if you're on YouTube, feel free to subscribe, share, like. Thank you all again. I look forward to hearing from you all soon. Hi everyone, Sam here from Black Real Estate Dialogue. Make sure to hit that notification bell and that subscribe button and to visit us at blackrealestatedialogue.com.